All right, here we go, part three. We'll see how this goes. We're going to start out with Transit Rider 1, as you can see here. I saw your complete video on the day you went to the Ruckman conference. Did you ever have your Bible signed by Ruckman? Oh, that's the black page. Uh, uh, there's the inside of my Bible. I mean, I can show you different pages. Some of the stuff, you know, I have personal pictures and stuff of my family in there, so I don't need to be showing that stuff. But uh, no, I never had my Bible signed by Ruckman. Okay. Um, I noticed that those that debunk you use video clips from your video clips out of context. Brian Moonan, yeah. For example, they used the person in this video getting his Bible signed in jeans and a green shirt with sleeves rolled up with a silver watch on in the right hand and the person's head was cut off so you couldn't see who it really was. They say you worship Ruckman because you got your Bible signed by him. They'll lie about me, of course they do that. Uh, when clearly you show you finally got to meet him as he was leaving in a van and you were wearing a blue suit and tie at the start and end of the video, I privately exposed this to them directly and got no response from them. I believe it was not you. Can you confirm this? It wasn't. Make a quick comment on the deception used in their videos. I also noticed that they use a lot of the comments when you are being sarcastic to prove a point or debunk something and make it sound like that is what you teach. Uh, that's why I'll say occasionally, I'll say, okay, now you people out there that want to you know, make me look bad, here's where you want to cut it out, okay? And they're probably even doing that. I don't know, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, they'll do that. Um, you say, what's going on there? Well, let me show you. Let me show you what this is all about. This is this is a very old practice. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse one. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. So see, people were actually writing letters and signing Paul's name to it. Paul talks in another place about we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. Um, lying false prophets will lie about you. They will personally slander you and they will chop up your videos. Brian Moonan is a lying false prophet. He did that with Eric Phelps. He did it with uh, Ruckman. You know, I joked about and uh, we did on my secondary channel, my wife and I did the thing of the danger of religious uniforms. And I said, you know, we were joking at the beginning and I said, oh great, somebody's probably going to cut this and use this against us. And ironically, I actually saw some, there's some wingnut that's been uh, attacking my ministry for years and years and years now. Patrick, the free, the free will Baptist, you know, <laughs> it's like, okay, and we call him Patrick, the free will papist. And I saw he had some video where he was showing our other video where I was Dr. Smarty Pants and my wife is Mother Superior Saint Catherine, you know, and, uh, you know, the cutting clips out of that, you know, Eric Phelps comes out and he does a video where he's pretending to be a Jesuit, you know, just like we pretended to be, you know, Catholics and stuff. We're doing it to answer the fools according to their folly. That's why we do those things. But you see, if you're, if you are lost and you're trying to get any dirt that you can on saved people, you'll come in and you'll cut that out. Another thing, uh, the racist railers propaganda Satanism that, uh, Moon Ann put out, um, he comes out and he uses clips of Dr. Ruckman when Dr. Ruckman is being funny, when he's going hoo, 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 like that or something, just being silly in one of his sermons. And you cut that out and you put that in there like, oh, see, here's the caliber of preacher that, that's not what Christians do, okay? I mean, it's one thing to, you know, expose people according to the words that they're saying, according to what their doctrine is and make fun of that. I've done that with Steven Anderson. I've done it with others where they come out and they say such kooky things. That's one thing. I'm attacking what they're saying. I'm not attacking what they're looking like or whatever else. I'm not attacking that. So, no, I did not have my Bible signed by Ruckman when I met him. Honestly, it was like, it was a very quick meeting. Ruckman was getting in the, the minivan. All I wanted to say to him was, thank you, brother, for what you've taught me. I said, I've learned a lot. He said, oh, praise the Lord. And I said, I said, uh, is there anything that, uh, any prayer requests or anything? And he said, oh, he said, brother, he said, my eyes are really going bad. I'm really having some problems with my eyesight. And I said, 
well, thank you, brother. I said, well, I'll pray for that. And he said, yeah, no problem. Grabs the door and shut it, and they drove off. That was literally the only contact I had with Dr. Ruckman. Um, he said, well, you ought to go down there. You ought to try to meet him and, and talk to him. No, he's got work to do for the Lord. I have work to do for the Lord, okay? I'm thankful for the stuff he's put out. Praise the Lord. And I know he's a busy man. And, you know, that's my advice for a lot of you that, that have been blessed by this ministry. Um, I'm more than happy to meet with people and more than happy to, to visit with brethren and stuff like that um, in certain situations. But, but uh, you know, we all have work to do. Our time of meeting, our time of fellowship, where we're face-to-face, -face, you know, and we're having a good time is going to be the rapture. So let's get the work done of the Lord so that we can leave. Okay, next we have Adri Ruiz. Dear Brian, can you please answer these two questions? In the millennium, are people going to be there with their families again if your family is saved? For example, husband and wife, if they both saved and they will be there again together. Also, after the millennium and the New Jerusalem, does the Bible mention if people recognize their loved ones, saved ones, and how will the new bodies uh, will be? Uh, will they be like the Lord Jesus as when he did appear to Thomas? He has an unperishable body. Thank you. And yes, I've already talked about that somewhat. Um, yeah, I, I do believe that we're going to have an incorruptible body. But as far as knowing, what's our mind going to be like then? You know, Because people say, well, if women are men, then how are we going to recognize our saved sisters? How will our us as husbands recognize our saved wives? You know, and let's look here. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 9. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Now, the that which is perfect there is a reference to Jesus Christ. I don't believe it's a reference to the Bible being completed, the New Testament being finished, written. You say, well, it's, it's a neuter. It's that. Okay, you know, then why did the angel say to Mary, that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called, you know, the son of the highest? Okay, uh, Jesus is referred to in the neuter. It's not a big deal. Okay, sometimes in the King James Bible. Um, but when that which is perfect is come, Jesus Christ, then that which is in part shall be done away. Our mind, the way we think right now. Verse 11, When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For when now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. What does that mean? We are known right now. The Lord knows more about us than we know about ourselves. He knows everything. Okay? And when we get to be with Him, we're going to think the same way. We'll have the mind of Christ. Truly have the mind of Christ. I mean, how are we going to rule and reign with Him for a thousand years with our present condition as Christians? You know, we're going to be down here, you know, fighting over where the earth is flat or round or, you know, whatever. <laughs> of course not. We're going to have the mind of Christ at that point in time. So, if we can understand who is who among the body of Christ down here, why do you think we would have less intelligence when we get up there to be with the Lord? We'll understand things just fine. So, um, are we going to be with our loved ones and things like that? Well, if your family is saved, uh, yeah, you'll be with them. Um, you know, is it is it going to be husband and wife in the same mansion, just as two angels or something, two male angels? Uh, or is it going to be next door to each other? Or, I don't know. I really don't know. I don't have a good answer for that one. Um, S. Ben Ora says, great, do it. Okay, I am. Thank you. <laughs> that's, that's an easy one to answer. Okay, King James Believer, I have to write these things down here. Uh, brother, would you, what about a call in Q and A? I don't want to link to them, but there are atheist channels here on YouTube where they do live calls and answer them live. They use a one eight hundred number. You also have full power where if a wolf calls in to harass you, have the power to just disconnect and say bye bye, next caller. Uh, you could also sign up here, talkshoe.com, and video record all your call-ins and then upload it to YouTube. 
In fact, you can do a live sermon and take questions after. Check out the about for talkshoe.com. Well, uh, might be a possibility in the future. You know, um, I don't know at this point. You know, uh, being that we have a, a young little baby, you know, um, he's going to be 16 months old soon, and you know, he's he takes a nap. There's times when you know I need to run up and get him because my wife's right in the middle of doing something, or she needs to go up and I, you know, help with this or help with that. You know, it's our first child. I mean, we're we're learning a lot of things and stuff, so. I can't just be, you know, live broadcasts and things like that might be a little bit tricky right now till, you know, we get some things ironed out a little bit more and, and um, he's a little bit older where he's not going to need, we can be just playing or whatever else. I mean, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on with that. So live broadcasts right now, eh, not really sure how much of that I want to I do. Um, M. Landau. Uh, AV 1611 KJB just a quick question for you brother Brian there are no house churches in my immediate area and the only one in my state would require an all day trip I don't care to enter another Babel building if I can if I can help it either good for you uh, what would you suggest a person do in a situation like this thanks and may God continue to bless this ministry and you and yours as well thanks well thank you Praise the Lord. Um, what do you do when you are saved and a Bible believer and there's nobody else around? Well, again, you have to go back to what did they do in the first century? Uh, you know, the, the fact is a lot of these house churches were extremely small um, and it was literally just a couple people. You know, again, we have kind of a false notion, a lot of people, I'm not saying you, but I'm saying... A lot of people have a false notion that you get thousands of people in a church and that's really of the Lord and whatever else. Uh, it's never been that way among the body of Christ. You know, when you have the day of Pentecost there in Acts chapter 2, yeah, there's a lot of people gathered there, but they weren't inside of a building and they weren't, didn't all continue meeting together as a 3,000 strong group. Uh, that's not there. You had teachers being separated and split up and going to each of those you know, small groups of people, and then they would spread out. Um, the Bible solution is to get people saved and then disciple those people. If you've learned the Bible, then a witness to coworkers, witness to friends, family, whatever. If you get somebody saved, then you go meet with them. Uh, form your own house church, in other words. Uh, you say, but I'd like to fellowship with others. Well, you know, it's it, it's a great thing to be able to fellowship with others, but if there's nobody in your immediate area, then pray about it you know again you know God has you where you're at for a reason you know you were saying about it uh, it'd take you a day a whole day to get to where the nearest house church is uh, well you know then the Lord has you where you're at for a reason right we, we should not be moving to places and stuff and I got to go way over here to fellowship with these brethren uh, God has you in there uh, as a minister of reconciliation you know the Bible talks about that and, um, you know, imagine it this way. You, uh, you're you an, an ambassador for America. You go in, you go through the training and whatever else, and they say, okay, we're going to send you down to Argentina to be our to work at the American Embassy in Argentina. You say, well, you know, how many people are there? Well, you'll be the only one at the American Embassy. Well, couldn't I go over to Bolivia? There's a whole bunch of, you know, American ambassadors over there. No, we want you to be the only one there. You know, see, it's God specifically has Christians in different little small towns, little areas, so that you can do His work there. So uh, pray about it. That's something you know I'd pray about. You know, and really try to to uh, start up a little ministry there and, and witness to some people. And uh, if you can get somebody to the point where they they want to get saved and they get saved, then just go. You know. Pick a day of the week. It doesn't even have to be Sunday morning from 9 to 12 or something like that. Just pick a day when you can go over and teach them the Bible or give them, you know, whatever they need to grow. That would be my, my uh, suggestion for you. Okay, next we have KJV Defense. Good uh, username. Husky394XP. I am a skeptic. 
So do the Illuminati exist? If so, who are they? What books can you recommend other than Bloodlines of the of Illuminati? Yeah, Fritz Springmeier has some iffy things. I mean, I've seen the guy speak at different places. He sounds more like a New Ager than a Bible believer. Um, yeah, I mean, I it some of that stuff I think it's okay to look at simply for reference, but you know, be careful. Um, as far as uh, the Illuminati, um, who are they? Uh, you're, it's going to be very hard to find that out. Um, you know, Bill Schneblin, again, he's got some issues too, but, you know, I think his video exposing the Illuminati from within, he was a member of the Illuminati, and he said he only knew, like, two other people that were in the Illuminati. They have a, a system of cells where you you know two people, and that person knows two people, and this person knows two people, and whatever else. And uh, so to say, I, I know who all's in the Illuminati, yeah, it's going to be very tough. Um, the way I would see, you know, people in the Illuminati, Illuminati is just basically people who are fully given, completely given over to Satan. Um, they've been illuminated so they can see the way the world really is. And, you know, so you would have, you know, groups of high-ranking Masons. Some of those could be Illuminati, high-ranking Roman Catholics. Illuminati, you know, you get like Rockefellers and stuff like this, uh, the Bilderberg groups that meet and stuff, uh, Bohemian Grove, a lot of those guys are going to be Illuminati um, in some form or another. So uh, the actual organization of the Illuminati I think is somewhat misleading um, in that I would say anybody that gets up into the high ranks of Satanism is technically illuminated and therefore although maybe not part of an organization called Illuminati, they're still in connection with Satan and doing his bidding. That would be how I'd answer that. Next we have In Season, Out. Uh, does Second John 9 through 11 include lost friends and family members? Um, I've never heard or read anyone concerning this verse. Uh, well, it's go there, the book of 2 John, we'll read it here before we go any further, 2 John, uh, whoop, yeah, 2 John verse 9 through 11, whosoever transgresseth, transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God, he that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son, if there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, Neither, neither bid him God's speed, for he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. Okay, does this include lost friends and family members? I would say yes to that. I really would. Um, again, we've been very much conditioned to think that you have to be nice to family members and things, and because they're family. Well, you know... It, it gets to a point, though, especially nowadays, where you have, you know, family members that can be just absolutely antichrist. And so I would say, you know, um, you know, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed. I see that more as uh, when you're receiving them into your house. I don't mean necessarily think it's it's you know they have to use the bathroom and you say you can't. You have to go out on the lawn or something. No, I think it's what it's talking about is receiving them into your house in the sense of fellowshipping with them, of uh, you know when you bid them God's speed. That's what you do to other saved people. I think the danger there is is treating them as if they're saved when they're not. I think it's mainly what's going on with that text. Um, continue reading here if so how could I tell them they are not welcome inside my home but be a good witness also also who are the my brethren that Jesus spoke of in Matthew 25 verse 40 um, 31 through 46 judgment of nations is verse 40 similar to Acts 9 4 when Saul was persecuting the body of Christ I notice this is Saul and not Paul the apostle to the Gentiles yet so I'm thinking these passage, two passages refer to Jews but perhaps Jew as well as Gentile doing the Father's will in light of Matthew 12:50 and Luke 8:21. <sighs> There's a lot of stuff to go over there. Very good question, very detailed. Um, basically, in Matthew chapter 25, you would have um, Jesus is basically saying, you've gone, you've visited, you know, 
them in prison, you know, and all that stuff. Uh, and I think that that's, I, th I would agree that that is probably pointing to a Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble. And those people that make it into the millennial kingdom are those that are being nice and to the Jews. And, uh, you know, maybe even some saved Gentiles. I'm not sure. Again, that's that stuff that's getting into another dispensation, and I'm just kind of like, I don't really understand. I mean, you get into the, the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, it's almost, you know, purely works that they're being judged for. You know, the judgment of the nations, uh, Jesus isn't saying anything at all about faith in him and what he did on the cross. It's all, you know, works that they're being judged for, whether or not they get into the millennial kingdom. Um, you know, you could even probably make the argument that all of the people that left or left there, you know, had faith in Jesus at some in, in some way or whatever. But the only ones that go into the millennial kingdom are those that you know were doing good deeds along with it. Uh, again, it's it's that stuff is difficult. I don't really know what to say there. But uh, how can you witness to your friends and family if you're not even allowed to have them in your house? Um, again, you know, what is the attitude? Of the friends and family. I mean, do you have a brother that is open and curious about the things of the Lord, uh, and and is loving and caring enough to say, you know, I'd like to hear more about this. You know, somebody like that. I don't think that it's a sin to have them come into your home. Um, you know, you're not bringing them into your house, uh, receiving them in into your house and bidding them Godspeed in the sense of, you know, worshiping with them. I think that that's a sin. I think that that would be a problem to have somebody lost come into like a house church meeting. I think that that would be the real context of what's going on there. Um, but witnessing to a lost family member, I don't think that there's a problem if they're open. Now, if they are just, just, they hate God, they hate the Bible, they hate what you are, whatever else, absolutely not. Don't have them in your home. No way. Uh, especially nowadays. It's it's getting more and more so that uh, people really hate the Bible. So that would be my answer to that. Next we have Kathy Hagel. Quick ideas for Bible study. What do you think of the SOAK method or do you have any other ideas that are better? As I am at a loss. Um, well, if you soak your Bible, I don't think you'll be able to read it. That's not what it means. I, I had to look it up, actually. Let me see if I can find this article again. I, I was like, soak method? I had never heard of this. Uh, studying the Bible using the soak method. Coloring chart and meditation. Um, this article here you can see. I'm going to go down here to what this acronym means. The S stands for Scripture. Read the chapter for the day. Then choose one to two verses and write them out word for word. There's no right or wrong choice. Just let the Holy Spirit guide you. O stands for Observation. Look at the verse or verses you wrote out. Write one or two observations. What stands out to you? What do you learn about the character of God from these verses? Is there a promise, command, or teaching? A stands for Application. Personalize the verses. What is God saying to you? How can you apply them to your life? Are there any changes you need to make or an action to take? The K stands for kneeling in prayer. Paul's kneel and pray. Confess your, any sin God has revealed to you today. Praise God for his word. Pray the passage over your own life or someone you love. Ask God to help you live out your applications. Um, I don't know. Some of that sounds okay, but, you know, there was a thing that came out years ago, this uh, prayer of Jabez thing, and it was like, you know, bless me, bless me indeed, or something, you know, and then you, you take that verse and you, you pray that over things that you want, and you get into some danger with that. You know, it's, it's not, it's not uh, dispensational. I forgot to turn that light on. It's not dispensational. You're, you know, people were taking that passage out of context. It was something specifically for, you know, uh, Jabez, I, I guess it was. I'd have to look up the passage, but um, you know, you can go back to the Old Testament. You can take something out of context where God says, I'm going to bless the house of David or whatever. God bless Solomon with great wealth or something. And you go, well, see, I'll take that verse, you know, and then God will bless me with great wealth. Uh, you know, it can get a little bit... 
I, I'm, I'm not really into fad ways of studying the Bible. Um, uh, what would be good ways? Uh, do you have any other ideas that are better? Um, my best advice on the thing of how to study the Bible is you can, I think I might even have a video on that, I'm not sure, but I think that you can, you can uh, approach the Bible from a word study. Um, what does the Bible say about, uh, you know, health, healing, something like that? What does the Bible say about love? What does the Bible say about fear? Uh, you know, just do a word study. Get a concordance and look up every time that the word fear appears and see what, you know, God has to say about fear. I think word studies are good. Uh, again, avoid the Hebrew and the Greek thing. Uh, you get into that stuff, there's so many problems, so many pitfalls to the whole thing of studying the Hebrew and Greek. Um, you can get into false uh, definitions. Some of the Hebrew and Greek lexicons are not accurate, and they can falsely define words. Uh, you can get into the thing of false texts, false Greek manuscripts. That's why I avoid the Hebrew and the Greek thing. God gave us our King James Bible. We don't, you know, just rely on that. Um, you can pick, you know, pick a book of the Bible and just go through it. You know, what I've been doing right now is this whole thing of 2 Corinthians. I'm going through each of the Pauline epistles and seeing are there scriptures in here that would point to the rapture being before the time of Jacob's trouble. And, of course, there are. There's lots of them. So that's a way I'm studying the Bible right now. So there's... There's different things out there, but some of this this soak stuff, it looks okay on the surface. But I don't. My only comment would be the thing of of uh, kind of picking verses and then kind of praying those verses and stuff. It could that could get a little bit carnal. It, like I said, if you're picking verses that would you know point towards money or something like that. So that's what I would say on that. Carol. Carol in his service. Okay. Let's see if I can write this out here quick. Carol in his service. I am concerned there is a false teacher out there teaching a false gospel pertaining to the Essene humane gospel, a vegan Jesus who was espoused to a woman and Joseph was the biological father of Jesus. The version of the Lord's Prayer according to these Essenes contained Mother Earth in it. And all of us who eat meat are a graveyard of dead flesh, and we will be punished by God. How can you see? Now you can see, or now can you see why am I, why I am concerned? He has almost 49,000 subs. Can you make a video exposing the dangers of this false Essene gospel? Well, possibly. Um, the way I would simply answer somebody like that, and you know, I haven't really looked into this study. I would just—it's so obviously corrupt and perverse that I would just be like use this verse on them, or these verses. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, which is what this Essene gospel is all about, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving and with thanksgiving for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. So anybody that's preaching forced vegetarianism, uh, the Bible says it's a seducing spirit and a doctrine of devils. So that's how I would answer this Essene gospel thing without getting into a big detailed study of where it came from or whatever else. I haven't done that much research yet on it. Um, um, again, we have in L-U-L-Z, we trust. Brother Ryan, is Ruckman's commentary worth getting? I already have his reference Bible. Will I be missing out on something if I don't get the entire commentary series? Um, again, one brother answered here, but I'll answer the question. Uh, you know, Dr. Ruckman has a lot of good stuff to say in his commentaries, and I do recommend them. I have all of them. I think he might have been coming out. He might have come out with some new ones, which I don't have yet. But I've I have most of them, uh, if not all of them. Um, 
honestly, I don't refer to them very much. Uh, I, I will occasionally, if I'm kind of stumped on a verse, I'll look up and I'll pray about it and I'll say, okay, yeah, that seems to make sense. Or, well, I, I don't think he got it either. Um, I think they're good, uh, definitely. But it's like anything else. It's, it's you know, written by a man, so you just have to keep that in mind. Um, you don't really need uh, all the commentaries. I think if you're going to do a study of the of a certain book, I'd buy a commentary. You know, I bought a lot of this stuff back when I was young and in the ministry, or, you know, before I entered the ministry, excuse me. And I would just like, I was buying every, you know, spending every cent I had trying to buy books and have, you know, a great library and everything. And I have a lot of books that, you know, aren't even on, you don't even see behind me when I'm, you know, speaking. But, uh, you know, do you really need all of them? Not really. I think that you can, you know, if that's something that you want to do over time, just get a, you know, want to stu study the book of Matthew and you buy the book of Matthew commentary and read it, great. Um, okay, here we go again with Petra, P-A-H-L, Paul, I guess is how you pronounce that. Not sure, I'm not sure. Um, question, what is the best way to study the Bible? Which And which other tools do you recommend? Um, well, I study the Bible with the, I use a Strong's Concordance. I don't waste my time with the Hebrew and the Greek. Strong's Concordance for uh, looking up specific words. And you can do word studies. I just talked about that a little bit ago. Um, the other thing is Webster's 1828 Dictionary. I believe in that. I don't, it's not scripture. I don't elevate it to the level of scripture. But that will define a lot of your words the way that they're, it's a closer to biblical definition. You'll see a lot of words um, actually will change meaning over time. Uh, the interesting thing, actually, I haven't talked about this in a video. I wanted to make a video on it, but just haven't brought it out yet. But the word sodomite, if you look it up in the 1828 dictionary, and I also have a bunch of older dictionaries from the 1800s and things, they'll say it's man and man. You look it up in a modern dictionary, they'll just refer to it as a certain type of, uh, you know, sex that's man and man or man and woman. So they kind of change definitions. Uh, there's a lot of that that goes on with the 18 or the, the newer dictionaries. So Strong's Concordance, Webster's 1820 Dictionary. Uh, another thing that you can use, which I use a lot, I'll show it here on uh, video. This here, Sword Searcher. It has a lot of the old uh, um, older ones here, Wycliffe, Tyndale, 1611 edition of the King James, King James 2000, some newer one. I just put it on there for interest. Uh, Darby's translation, the Bishop's Bible, uh, with King James Version with Strong's links to the he Hebrew and Greek. Again, I don't even use that. I just left it in there. But they also had, I think, some newer versions, too, to compare and whatever else. But I use that. Um, there's a whole lot of stuff that you can do with that. Uh, it has Webster's 1820 Dictionary right in with it. Um, Sword Searcher is pretty good. I've used that for years and years now. So, uh, But there's a lot of different ways that you can study the Bible, which I've already mentioned. So, uh, Next we have Joe77712. All right, uh, it says here, Hi, brother. Do you believe Christians should celebrate Christmas? Uh, again, Sister Lencia Davis writes, uh, hi there, Brian. I actually did a video last year answering this question in detail. Here's the link. Uh, she says she disagrees with me on that, and that's fine. And, uh, you know, I get a lot of people that disagree with me on things, and so that's that's okay. Um, I personally, you know, we, we do celebrate Christmas. Uh, in German, it would be Weihnachten, and that's what we do. We don't we don't uh, have anything to do with Santa Claus or some of the other types of things like that. Um, to us, it's not about going and getting huge amounts of presents or anything else. I mean, we, you know, we take it easy and things, but we love to see, you know, lights and things and and uh, whatever. So people don't have to agree with that if they don't want to. That's okay. Uh, T L E. Turn says, uh, wow, Brian, you really, you have really got a lot of questions on your plate. I see where Ken Hoven also answers a lot of questions on his channel. He has only been out of prison since August, but the amount of videos 
he has already cranked out is simply amazing, like several a day. Yeah, well, uh, you know, some of the questions I think he can answer are okay, but I, I have to avoid Ken Hovind. Uh, he's wrong on a couple very, very major areas now. I'm not going to be recommending Ken Hovind again unless he repents um, of some very false teachings, and so I would not recommend Ken Hovind anymore. Um, Michael, let's see, I got here, yeah, Michael Bartell. Michael Bartell. Some advice on witnessing to Mormons. I have a couple of friends from back in high school who are Mormon and they just got back or are getting back shortly from their missions. I've been studying the Bible a lot and I've read a fair bit about Mormonism, but I've never physically witnessed to any of them before. Some tips would be great. Thanks and God bless. Well, this might be interesting to some of you, but I've never actually witnessed to a Mormon either. Uh, I've never had a confrontation with them. It's kind of weird. All through the years, I've never had a, a Mormon ever come to any place I've ever lived. I've never seen one on the street. I mean, I guess I could, you know, get in the car and just try to hunt some down someplace, but, you know, I've never actually had a confrontation with them. I know some brethren have. A uh, brother I used to be in ministry with, uh, Jesse Dulesky, he actually lived out in Salt Lake City, Utah. So he confronted quite a few of them. And he was very proficient with knowing how to answer them and how to you know, get into the conversations and trap them so that they would see that their system's wrong and bring up stuff about the Book of Mormon and whatever else. Um, I just never have had any experience in it. Again, I'm not a, a you know, um, master of all different things out there. Uh, you know, I would just simply keep it focused on Jesus and on the fact that they're sinners and that Jesus is the only way to heaven. Uh, you can get into a lot of the stuff like with Jehovah's Witnesses. I have a lot more experience with them. I used to work with one. I've had quite a few times of encounters with Jehovah's Witnesses. And I always try to get it back to, do you know for sure where you're going when you die? Or is it that you have to continue to uh, do what your organization tells you to do? And see, it's the same thing with Mormonism. They're going to have to continue to be part of their organization, and they can't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ apart from the Mormon church. You know, same thing with Jehovah's Witnesses or Catholics or a lot of them. So, again, I can't really comment a whole lot on the thing of how to deal with Mormons because I haven't dealt, dealt with much with them. It's not one of my areas of expertise. But I would just keep it on sin and about Jesus. And do they know for sure where they're going to go when they die? And I'll give you one verse that you can use on them, which I think would be a great one. Because um, this is one that you'll get from people that are do-gooders, which is what the Mormons are. They're, they're trying to work their way to heaven. And I think this is a good one. Uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. You can know, you're supposed to know, that you have eternal life. They can't know because their organization does not tell them. They can believe that they might have eternal life, but they can't know it. So, and you can read the other verses there, verses 10 through 13 in 1 John chapter 5. Some good stuff to answer them. Okay, now, next we have Donch, I guess. I'd like to know how you got the idea that the Luther German Bible is from the received text manuscript. I can read both English and German, and they're sure not the same to me. Okay, well, if you do the study, uh, Luther did use uh, Erasmus's text. Now, there were some other things, I think, that kind of, uh, the, I don't think it really changed a whole lot uh, when you went through Stephanus and, and Beza and Beza and the Elzever brothers and things to receive text. But... Um, Luther definitely used Erasmus's Greek text to make his translation. And I know that I've talked to other people and they say that the Luther translation does differ in a few areas. Like it says, uh, Morning Star back in Isaiah 14, verse 12, whereas the King James Bible says Lucifer you know, has fallen from heaven, uh, which is the correct translation. You don't call him the Morning Star. That's Jesus' title. But uh, there's a couple other spots here and there where Luther is off. So, um, yes, he did use... Um, the received text, but Luther, Luther's problem was that he was not trying to leave Catholicism, he was trying to reform it. And I think that there was a bit more 
conspiracy type of stuff going on there. I think that he was a a steam valve, so to speak, for Catholics that wanted out of Catholicism. You let them get out into another, you know, they can think that they're away from Catholicism and all that they're doing is just going into Lutheranism, which is another branch of Catholicism. And now the Vatican has built a statue, erected a statue to Martin Luther in Rome. So he's not really the enemy of Roman Catholicism. Uh, and of course he was very radically against the Jews and, you know, wrote books on uh, replacement theology the Jews and their lies actually so used by Hitler um, Bible in depth is the next comment <clears throat> watch out for all these weird doctrines arising for instance yes there was the Holy Ghost before Jesus ascended these people say no which is wrong I can quote scriptures there's one saying that New Testament didn't start till Christ died on the cross wrong again uh, no actually it's not uh, it began with his ministry, which includes his genealogy, birth, and childhood, and John the Baptist, which was the beginning of the Lord coming in the flesh, in which the angels sang about, which fulfilled prophecy and begins the new hope, the New Testament. Uh, you are very wrong. I am sorry, but you are wrong. That is not a new doctrine. It is a Bible doctrine, and I will show it to you, and you will conform to the Scriptures, and not because it's my interpretation. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 15 through 17 and for this cause he is the mediator of the new testament that by means of death for the redemption of the transgression that were under the first testament they which are called might it receive the promise of eternal inheritance for a wary testament is there must also of necessity be the death of the testator now here you go verse 17 for a testament is of force after men are dead otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth the New Testament began with the death of the testator according to Hebrews chapter 9 verses 15 through 17. Right there. Okay? You say, well, I have a problem with it. Then you have a problem with the Bible. You don't have a problem with what I teach. Okay? Going down through here, we have again in L-U-L-Z we trust. Okay, Brian, this is not a question, not really a question. I just want to get this message out since I know that you have many viewers. This video is very eye-opening. It shows how the Jesuit-led Muslim immigration is destroying Europe. Trust me, if you thought that race mixing and multi multiculturalism is okay, you won't after seeing that video. Well, I have no idea what the video is. Um, I don't have time to watch it. I don't know. I'll have to leave that up to people to decide one way or the other. Next, we have Billy Rubin. I mean, if the video is bad, you know, somebody let me know and I'll, I'll get rid of it. I have no idea. Um, okay, Billy Rubin says, uh, What are your thoughts about modern-day masonry, and do you think it actually goes back to Solomon's Temple? Uh, well, they, they take a lot of ritual stuff from Solomon's Temple. Um, it, and do I think it goes back, you know, modern-day masonry? Well, I know Bill Schneblin has some stuff on how you know, from his video exposing the Illuminati from within, how masonry developed down through the the millennia, um, and certainly King Solomon messed around in the occult. You know, uh, you know, many people say that the Star of David is actually more properly called the Seal of Solomon, and I think there's probably some truth to that. The Star of your God, Remphan, you know, and all these other false gods that the Jews brought in. I think that the six-pointed star represents them. Uh, so, do the Masons go back to that? Well, in, in some ways I would say yes to that. It's that same satanic spirit um, that's changed names, changed somewhat of their practices down through the centuries. But I would say that, yeah, you could probably trace it back um, with changes involved in it. Um, and my thoughts about modern day Masonry is that I think that uh, the modern day masonry is actually failing. I think it's faltering um, in the sense of uh, the numbers are not real high anymore like they once were, but it's because there's so many other wicked organizations out there that people are into that stuff now. So masonry is becoming mainstream in the sense of you don't even have to be an initiated mason. You just kind of do the things that are popular in this world and you're in many ways practicing masonry. 
So that would be my answer to that. Um, Bible in depth says, let me write it down here so I can put this in the description area. Bible in depth, in depth, not in depth. How many baptisms are there? Number one, baptism by water. Number two, baptism of Holy Ghost. Number three, baptism by fire. Number four, baptism of repentance. Luke 3, 3. Someone tell Hoven that repentance is not a work. And yes, it is necessary for salvation, not just being believing alone. Believing is the first step. Okay, yeah, I would agree with, you know, the thing of uh, repentance is not a work. It's definitely necessary for salvation. Um, from my understanding, there are actually seven baptisms um, mentioned. Okay, so... Uh, I'm not going to get into all those right now. I don't even have the list here. I'd, I'd have to, you know, have those uh, typed out or something. Maybe I'll do a study on that at some point in time. But I do believe there are seven baptisms total. Um, so that would be an answer to that. Okay. J.T. does. Okay. Ryan, how do I profess to youthful people who are lost? Uh, I'm forced in a corrupt high school education with many evolutionists, sodomites, and the whole meat and potatoes. I like meat and potatoes, man. I know what you're saying. Just got to put a little sarcasm there. Uh, what's your advice? Uh, well, you know, when I was in high school, went to a public high school, Peckway Valley High School, graduated in 1994. I'm an old geezer. Maybe not some of as old as some of you, but uh, um, back when I was going there, I was a professing Christian, but I pretty much lived very wickedly. And uh, so how would I have handled it if I knew what I know now, back then, if I was genuinely saved? Um, and I know a lot, of, a lot of younger people that are saved that you're in a situation where you can't be homeschooled. I would say if you could talk to your parents about homeschooling, that'd be the best solution to get out of there. But uh, if I was forced into a situation like that, um, you know, I would just simply try to live as righteously around them as you can. I mean, and of course, you know, they'll call you self-righteous if you say, I don't want to smoke, I don't want to fornicate, I don't want to this, I don't want to that. They'll call you self-righteous, which is not even true. They're the ones that are self-righteous if they reject Jesus Christ. They trust in their own righteousness. But um, I would just simply, it's going to be a struggle for you, to be quite frank. I mean, you're going to be pressed to do all kinds of things that are against your beliefs as a Christian, and I think that you're going to have to make that clear. Uh, I know I can't do that. You know, if the, if, the, uh, if you're in a class and they say that, you know, that sodomy is, is okay and whatever else, I think, you know, the best thing would just be to say, well, uh, I don't believe that way as a Christian. And if you say I'm forced to, then you're forcing me against my beliefs. You're discriminating against my religious convictions. Uh, that's how I would answer that. Um, witness to them, you know, tell them about Jesus and, and things. Uh, pray about it. I mean, it's 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 you're in a, forced into a situation where it's going to be very difficult to witness to a lot of those people. Okay, we have two others here from the same. Uh, person. Uh, also, you should do a video or do a review of a good KJV Bible. I found that is published by Baker Books, and praises King James, and it is and is a well-made Bible altogether. Okay. Uh, well, I have a lot of that right now planned. You know, in terms of eventually, I don't know when, but I have other study Bibles that have been sent to me and things. Could you do a study on this? Could you do a review? Well, we'll get there eventually. Uh, thirdly, they say just thought of another. How many archangels are there and what are their names? I understood there was only two, Gabriel and Michael, but I started seeing there's a lot more from different sources. Could you please clarify this, or the issue? Uh, well, I know, like, I think the uh, book of Enoch, I think it is, they have other archangels listed and things. Now, I'm real careful about the book of Enoch. I don't, I don't really trust the authorship of that thing. I think it was written by some Gnostics in the first century. Um, or maybe the second or third. I'm not even sure when they wrote it, but I, I don't believe it's that it was there, you know, written by actually Enoch. And I have a FAQ on that. So um, I believe that the two that are listed are Gabriel and Michael. Are there more? I have no idea. Uh, I, my 
beliefs come from the King James Bible, and if it's not in the King James Bible, then I just reject it. So, uh, and just simply reject it in the sense of saying, I don't know. Next we have Terry Wonder. What about kids of unsaved parents? I have a six-year-old great-grandniece who loves Jesus, but mother, no father, is saved. Going up in the uh, rapture. Many are saved. They wasn't spared during the time of Noah or Lot. Part two of the question, what about pets, heaven or not, as there are animals in heaven? Okay, um, well, there are definitely animals in heaven. I'll answer part two first, actually. There are definitely animals in heaven, but they are, I believe, eternal. Um, again, heaven is a prepared place. You can remember this statement, write it down. Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people, is the way I would say it. Um, it's, it's not that heaven is going to be all the good stuff that we had on earth up there waiting for us. You know, our favorite rocking chair in a little cabin in the woods with our favorite hunting dog, you know, there. Uh, no, it's going to be about Jesus Christ, and we're going there to worship Him. So, uh, yes, animals can be very dear pets. Yes, they can give us, give us very fond memories. I've had a few, you know, that have brought me very fond memories. Um, I always hated cats uh, all through my life, but when I first got married, my wife had a cat that she was very near and dear to, and uh, we, we had her and kept her for a while, and I actually ended up liking the cat, <laughs> believe it or not, and um, had some really fond memories with her. Is she going to be in heaven? No, she's not going to be in heaven. I don't believe that. Um, I mean, can't exactly repent and, and be saved. But um, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, um, verse 19 through 21 says, For that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth beasts. Even one thing befalleth them, as the one dieth, so dieth the other. Yea, they have all one breath, so that a man hath no preeminence above a beast, for all is vanity. All go unto one place. All are of the dust, and all turn to dust again. In other words, the flesh. We all have the breath of life in us. We all have flesh. But, look at 21. Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward, and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth? Okay? So, the spirit of man is going to go stand before God someday. The Bible says, as it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. Okay? So, we're all going to be judged by God as men. The beast, however, does not have, the animals do not have that same um, soul in them, is what I would call it there, the, you know, or spirit here in, in the sense of your spirit going to heaven. Um, they don't have that same thing. So when an animal dies, they are, it's essentially like part of the earth. Uh, a tree is not, you know, my favorite tree that I used to like to climb on when I was a boy or something. We had this big black cherry tree. Well, it was actually a bird cherry, if you want to be technical. Prunus avium, if you want to, the Latin on it. Um, it was a really beautiful tree. fell down in a storm. Well, that tree's not going to be waiting for me in heaven. Okay. Um, it was alive, and it died, but it's not going to be up in heaven. And I would say the same thing about animals here on the earth. So that's part two of the question. Part one, um, six-year-old great-grandniece who loves Jesus, but her father and mother are not saved, uh, going up in the rapture. Uh, yeah, I do believe that, that uh, children that are under the age of accountability are, will be going up in the rapture. I do believe that. Uh, some might say I'm wrong on that. Some might say, well, I don't believe so and whatever. Well, that's your opinion. Um, I can't be dogmatic. But I, again, I have a preacher rapture moment on that specific subject, whether children go up in the rapture or not. And I do believe that they do go up. Um... Jason Gennaro. Or Gennario. I guess, yeah, Gennario. Sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, brother. Um, hey, brother, do you believe the King James Bible teaches a geocentric universe? Okay, I've talked about this before. Geocentric, heliocentric are the two different theories. Heliocentric is the sun is here, the earth goes like this. Geocentric is the earth is here, and then sun and all the other planets go like that. Okay, um, you know, and, th and there's a lot of arguments for and against and stuff. Again, uh, you know, a guy handed me a book years and years and years ago, uh, probably, I don't even know, 
nine years ago, something like that. Uh, probably about eight or nine years ago, I guess, on this whole thing. And I was just like, I have no idea. You know, I, I really don't have time for this, to be honest with you. And, and I thought, you know, to me, it's, it's, it's just like the thing of Mormonism that I mentioned earlier. You know, uh, how do you witness to a Mormon? Well, you know, I haven't really had those run-ins yet. And I, I, I know about salvation and, and sin and, and everything else. And that's what I'm going to focus on with a Mormon. Do I know all this stuff about their system and where to pin them in different passages of the Book of Mormon? No, I don't. That's for somebody else to do. Uh, if somebody really wants to make a big deal about geocentricity and versus heliocentricity, that's for them. Okay, I know what God has for my ministry. I do talk about the Bible version issue, but I'm not going to get into all the Greek and the Hebrew and the shades and nuances of meaning and all that other stuff. It's a waste of time for me. There are men out there that have the mind for that, and they, they can do it, and that's fine. That's okay. Um, personally, uh, I'm not going to get into the conversation on it. Uh, that would be my answer to it. Um, you know, If somebody wants to study it, I'd say go ahead, sure, but just don't, don't get car carried away with it like it talks about in Hebrews 13, verse 9, like we talked about earlier. K. Jackson Can you please help me to understand if the Lord's Supper is a commandment or not? Is thanking God daily for what Jesus did on the cross for my sins sufficient, or must the bread and wine be taken? How often is it required to be taken, and is it necessary for salvation? This is a question that I find many answers to on the Internet, but what do you think about this biblically, since it isn't very clear to me in the Scriptures? Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Um... 1 Corinthians First Corinthians 11, verse 23 says here, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Remembrance of me. It's not about salvation. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. So it is supposed to be there in your life. Eating the bread, drinking the wine, which I would take to be new wine, grape juice, in other words. Um, and again, you know, the Lord's not going to be really overly picky if you get some... Uh, Welch's grape juice from the store and some saltine crackers or something like that. You know, it's it's not, you have to have it exactly perfectly as it was in the Old Testament or, or as it was, you know, with Jesus there with his disciples. No, you know, I think it's just, you're doing this thing symbolically, which we're going to see why here. But you see, it's a remembrance. It's not about salvation. Okay, the, the Catholics try to teach the perpetual sacrifice of Jesus through the Mass, uh, the Eucharistic uh, whole rigmarole thing that they do. Uh, that's unscriptural, completely unscriptural. I want to show you what the purpose is for this thing of what we would call communion. Uh, verse 27, Who, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Okay, what's going on there? You say, well, then it is about salvation. No, what's going on here is Paul is writing and saying, yes, you should do this in remembrance of the Lord, and somebody that's doing it unworthily is somebody who is not saved. Okay, why would you do something to remember what the Lord did on the cross when you haven't received what he did on the cross? See, that's what's going on there. If you're doing it unworthily, it's because you're not saved. It's not that now I've eaten and, dr and drank of the cup and I'm saved now, at least temporarily, till the next time I have to do it. See, that's what Catholicism teaches. I mean, if you can be saved by you know, eating the bread and drinking the wine, well, then why did Jesus die on the cross? What was the purpose of that? See, uh, Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins. What you do with what we would call communion, um, that's just to remember. 
And there's another reason. Let's keep reading here. Verse 30. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. What does that mean? Look at verse 31. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Okay. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home. That ye come not together unto condemnation, and the rest will I set in order when I come. Okay, when you come there, you shouldn't have, you be just like, oh, I just want something to drink and eat. You know, just, okay, give me that. I don't really care what it's about. Uh, another reason for the thing of communion is we're, we're remembering what Jesus did, but what's the purpose in us remembering it? It's a time of repentance. It's a time of us saying, okay, I need to get some things cleaned up in my life. It's a time of self-reflection. We're judging ourselves. Okay, that's why it's important to do this occasionally. Now, you know, you say, well, uh, how many times does it, does it have to be a daily thing? No, it doesn't have to be daily. Um, usually, we do it about once a year, okay? Um, there are some people that will do it once a month. Some people do it, you know, we do it once a year because a lot of times we're forgetting to do it. But it's a, just a simple thing of, it's a time of reflection on what Jesus did, how he paid for our sins on the cross. It's remembrance, doing it in remembrance. And I don't ever want to get to a point where we're just so, well, who cares that we don't even, you know, care about ever doing it. It's a time to judge yourself is the whole point of communion. Okay? You don't have to do it to be saved. Uh, you're doing it because you're saved and you're trying to stay in a right relationship with the Lord. If you're judging yourself, He won't judge you. All right? Won't judge you in the sense of, you know, you know what His Word says. You can live according to His Word, so therefore you're not messing around with sin. And He won't have to judge you in that sense. So, I'm going to stop it for now. Uh, this is part three. And I think we're going to go on to a part four. So we will be back here in part four. Thank you for watching.